Well, a happy new year to everyone. It is hard to believe that this is the last Sunday of 2013. Wow. I don't know about you, but for me, as you get older, it just goes faster and faster and faster. And this year is no exception to that. The finish of yet another year, <clears throat> another year of growing closer to the Lord's return, the beginning of a new year of discovering the riches that he has for us. Do you realize the riches that the Lord has for us? Whenever I think of the riches of the Lord, I always think of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Not every spiritual blessing uh, in our own lives, not every spiritual blessing in our church collectively, but every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Can you imagine what it would look like to be blessed that way? And yet that's precisely what the Lord has for us. He is ready. He's always ready to do his part. And all we need to do is to come to him with a surrendered heart and willingness to obey the things that he commands us to do. And there is absolutely <clears throat> no better way to do that than to consider what he has to say to us in his word. Do you realize that? That this, he has preserved it over these thousands and thousands of years. He's preserved the integrity that when you look throughout church history, whenever you see uh, problems in the church, you know, there's problems in the church. Not in our church, but in all other churches, there's problems. I'm totally kidding. Just want to see if you're awake. There's problems in every church. Why? Because every church is full of people. And people have problems. We have issues. I have issues. I have issues in, in my life. And, and the only one that can straighten those is, is the Lord Jesus Christ as outlined in the scriptures. And God preserved it so it would be a timely message from the very mouth of God to be able to encourage us through the things that we're going through. And as we're finishing up yet another year, I want to share with you this morning this pressing feeling that I have more than ever to do everything possible to lead us into a deeper appreciation of his word and the wealth of wisdom that lay within the pages of Scripture. So if you'll turn in your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 1. If you need a Bible, raise your hand, and one of the ushers will be sure to get one to you. Next week, we'll get back into the Gospel of Mark, but this morning, <clears throat> I feel a sense of urgency to stir your hearts. Mine's been stirred of late. To stir your hearts to a renewed understanding of why it is so very important that we give ourselves entirely to every aspect of God's Word. Entirely. Everything that we have. I think of 1 Timothy 4.15 where Paul writes, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. I see a lot of uh, Christians today who are struggling through things. They're weak in their faith. And the reason that they struggle is because they've not given themselves entirely to what the Word says about how to deal with the various things that come our way. Well, I, I cannot imagine what my life personally, not, not the pastoral ministry part of my life, my life personally would be like if I didn't have the assurance of his word in every area of our lives. And there's no better way to start off a new year <clears throat> than with a commitment to allow God's word to direct our lives. So let's stand together <clears throat> and let's begin by reading the first 11 verses of the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, <clears throat> If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdom, kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to Jesus, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall Worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left Jesus, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. O oh Lord, <clears throat> I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. We pray that it would speak to our hearts, that it would judge the thoughts and the attitudes of our hearts. And Lord, that you would just... Uh, renew our perspective of the value of the word in our lives and that we would enter into 2014 with a, a renewed determination to study, to show ourselves approved of God, uh, men and women who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Protect us from any distraction this morning that we might hear specifically what it is you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> This last year has been a, uh, a great, great year uh, for me. It's been, a, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster of a year. It's been a year where uh, there's been a significant shift in my thinking as it relates to the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. I've been teaching the Bible for, uh, my first Bible study was um, to a high school group through the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Uh, back in ooh, uh, 1982, <laughs> I believe that was. It's been a while. Uh, we started the church here 12 years ago. <clears throat> I've taught through the entire uh, New Testament and uh, several of the books a second time. And we're just a few books away from teaching through the Old Testament uh, on Wednesday nights. And I have found that there's this stirring in my heart as it relates to the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, and that is a wholehearted seeking to hear a specific word from the Lord, from His Word, and this is the, the key as it applies to my own life. What are you saying from the Word as it applies to my own life, and then a specific word and how it applies to us, South Hill Calvary Chapel, His Church, how it applies to us now. Uh, I think sometimes the tendency is to read the scriptures and to say, boy, that's a, that was an interesting history lesson. Uh, that was an interesting thing that happened uh, uh, within the period of the kings and the book of Judges. That was an interesting thing, all those laws and blood everywhere in Leviticus and all these sacrifices taking place. That's an interesting thing that <clears throat> happened on the road to Damascus and these things. Certainly more of the New Testament we can identify a little bit more so. But I realize that sometimes I just get caught up in just teaching you through the Bible that I don't, I don't cry out to the Lord, Lord, what specifically do you want to say to us that we need to know as a church that I need to know as a follower of you? I've been uh, significantly impacted recently <clears throat> as I've been reading and listening to a fair amount of Pastor John Piper. How many of you have heard of him or read <clears throat> any of, of his stuff? I have so much respect for the integrity of his of his ministry. I don't think I've ever, I mean, there's, there's, he's one of those teachers where you just listen to, and the thing I love so much about listening to him is that he lives and breathes and believes with all of his heart that the Bible has the final say in absolutely every area of his life. Every area of his life. And I know that we can say that we believe it, and I know that we do, 
But even for me, I find sometimes that I leave it in my brain. And I too often don't let it settle down into the depths and the resources of, of my heart. No, not, not every part of the word. There's some verses that are easy, more easily to settle there. But, but sometimes when I'm reading, for instance, teaching, I've been teaching for three years, going on four years in the prophets and just reading about judgment, judgment, judgment. And I can just, boy, when am I going to get through this history of the judgment? And I missed out on saying, Lord, what do you want to teach me about my life? from these prophetic books. And I know that as I begin to cry out to him, as I begin to uh, seek him to say, Lord, what do you have for me specifically and then for the church? I know that it will lead to living my life in a manner in which the Bible speaks. <clears throat> Pastor John uh, Piper has a podcast entitled Ask Pastor John. And uh, they're little four to eight minute responses on any number of issues, on uh, alcohol, uh, uh, is it okay for Christians to get tattoos, uh, parenting, Santa Claus, pornography, time management, homosexuality, uh, um, divorce, you name it, the list goes on and on and on. And what I really love about these things, I know that somebody hasn't sent him that question and then he studies on it for four or five months, and then he answers it. You would think so, as articulate as he is. I know, because sometimes he'll just say, oh, wow, uh, okay. He'll pause for a moment, and then he'll begin to share these profound thoughts on the subject from his heart, flowing out of the Word, because the Word has been settled deep in his heart. I was listening to one recently that really stirred me, in this area of teaching and preaching, it was entitled Busy pa Pastors and Biblical Encounters. Busy Pastors <clears throat> and Biblical Encounters. Boy, I went back, I've been going back and reading through some of my journals, which I do occasionally, and the one thing that's consistent in <laughs> most every journal entry is, Lord, help me to not be so busy. Lord, help me to not be so busy. In fact, I'm reading a great book right now called Crazy Busy. And I, well, the thing I love so much about it is he's, he's taking it from the perspective of I'm not going to teach you how to get through your to-do list. I'm not going to teach you how to do this. I'm going to share with you what I've learned about the sinfulness of being too busy, the sinfulness of crazy busyness. And so I've been reading this, and as I've been reading it, at the same time I listened to this little snippet. Actually, it was two, part one and part two little uh, six to eight minute segments called Busy Pastors and Biblical Encounters. And he was answering this question that somebody asked him about transitioning from academic ministry. He, he was a pref professor at a Bible college for about six years to the pastoral ministry. And what were some of the fears that came with that transition? And he began to share, well, I was afraid of losing the leisure to study. I was afraid that I'd lose that opportunity to discover more riches in the, in the things of God because all of my time as a, as a professor was just studying and teaching things over and over and I could just, that's how I spent my time. He said he would be, he was afraid he would lose the joy of discovering biblical uh, text, but he said it didn't turn out that way. He said, I discovered that though there isn't as much time to study with all of the pressures that come with the pastorate, and my ears were perking up, not to mention the never-ending pressures of having to prepare a spiritual meal for the people, I, my heart started stirring, okay, that's what I do. I, I get to prepare a spiritual meal for the people that attend our church. Instead, he said, the continual pressure had two effects. Now, I'd love to say, well, uh, the continual pressure has these two effects on my life, but I can't say that. The, the, the continual pressure causes me to make another journal entry that says, I'm too busy, make another journal entry uh, that says, Lord, I'm freaking out about this or about that. He said, two effects. Number one, the need for myself, he said, with prayerful desperation to daily be in the Word with food for my soul. Oh, I'm in the Word. But how many times am I in the, mood, in the Word saying, Lord, help me to prepare for this study instead of, Lord, first, I need food for my soul. He said, you can't run your pastoral car on yesterday's gas. The pressure, he said, forced me into the text. And then the interviewer asked Pastor John if there were passages from the Bible which supported what he was saying. And he mentioned a number of scriptures that supported that. 
Jesus saying to Peter, do you love me uh, three times? And after the third time, uh, Jesus tells Peter, feed my sheep. And he said, I'm called to feed the sheep of the flock at his church. And then he made a reference to the parable of the faithful servant, which I've read a number of times, Luke chapter 12, verse 42, where the Lord says, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? He emphasized uh, to give them their portion of food. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. And he spoke to to the number of times that that verse had spoken to him when he was overwhelmed with all of the other demands. He said this, this text steadied my hand so many times. And I thought, you know, when I read that text, I was trying to understand the meaning of the parable. I, I didn't approach it. I, I had to teach the parable. I didn't approach it of, of, Lord, what do you want to say to me personally? And then he gave one more that was a real zinger to me. It was the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 with a little boy's <coughs> sack lunch. And this is what he said that really spoke to me. Quote, I felt like this little boy so many times. Jesus says to the disciples, you give them something to eat. So he's saying to John Piper, you give them something to eat. And I say back to him, I feel like a little boy who's got a sack lunch. You're telling me to feed this people with my sack lunch? He says, whenever Jesus says to a pastor, you give them something to eat, he, meaning the Lord, won't let us down. He will take our little five loaves of ability and weakness and turn it into a feast for our people. End quote. And my heart just stirred, and I said, oh, Lord, that's what I want. I want to prepare feasts for our people. And I began to pray, and I immediately thought, Lord, am I so focused on teaching our church body through the Bible that, that somehow I miss out on that feast that you have for us, a feast that is applicable to us here and now? And this is what I'm most excited about <clears throat> in this coming year, to feast on God's Word personally, myself, to read through the Bible in a year yet again and to say every, every time I do, Lord, show me what you have for me personally in my own life. And then, Lord, show me what you have for us to feast on as a church body. To feast on God's word each and every opportunity that we have to get together. Why? Because Jesus said that his words, they're spirit and they are life. His words are life to us, John 6, 63. It is the very Word of God, it is by the very Word of God that we have life. And one of the reasons why I see anemic Christians is because they're not devouring the Word of God, or they're reading it and they're leaving it in their intellect. It's by the very Word that we have life, and this is what our text is saying that we just read. It is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It's shortly after his baptism and the public proclamation that uh, John the Baptist makes, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was shortly after that that Jesus finds himself in, this, in the wilderness being tempted, I believe, uh, by every temptation common to man uh, that's spoken of in Hebrews chapter 4. Three times Satan tempts Jesus misquoting God's word, and in response three times, Jesus refutes that which Satan was saying. How? With the correct use of God's word. Look at verse 3 in our text. When the tempter, when Satan came to Jesus, he said, if you're the son of God, he's questioning his deity, if you're the son of God, command that these stones become bread. He knew he was hungry. But Jesus answered and said, quoting Moses from Deuteronomy 8.3, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, it is written again, quoting 
Deuteronomy 6.16, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on the exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, quoting from Deuteronomy and Joshua, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Now, what's always fascinated me about this, of course, it should be no surprise to us that Satan misquotes the scripture or he, or he quotes it out of context. <clears throat> but what's always surprised me is Jesus, as we saw last week, is the word of God. And so anything he would have said would have been the word of God. But what we see is Jesus refers to the written word of God, he refers to the, the, the divinely inspired word of God that had been given to, through the Lord, to Moses and to Joshua. And in these verses, if you look specifically at verse 4, Jesus gives us the reason that we are to read his word, the reason that we're to take it in. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Do you realize how profound this verse is? How many of you ate breakfast this morning? Okay, a lot of us ate breakfast. But that breakfast, that food, it's only going to sustain us physically until we get hungry again, which some of you are right now. How many of you are hungry right now and ate breakfast? You see, we get hungry again and in the long run when this old tent completely breaks down all the food in the world won't do the body or the soul a bit of good but not so with God's Word not so with God's Word because God's Word it feeds the soul it feeds that which is eternal it nourishes us in a way that food could never nourish us when we find ourselves in a situation we lack wisdom we cry out to God and he reveals that through his word James 1 5 if any of you lacks wisdom let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him Proverbs 2 6 for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding turn with me to second Timothy <coughs> 2 Timothy, right in between uh, 1 Timothy and Titus. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy 3, 16. I've quoted this verse so many times. I love this verse. It, it's so powerful. It just summarizes, unlike uh, uh, in, in such a comprehensive way, the value of God's word. Look at 2 Timothy 3, beginning verse 16. All Scripture, all Scripture, all Scripture. Even the parts of Scripture that, oh, here we go. I'm going to read through that book again. Whoa, Lord, give me the grace to get through this one. <clears throat> I don't understand. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. A literal interpretation is that it's God-breathed. It is God-breathed. And it is profitable for doctrine, which means teaching, for reproof, which means conviction, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture, all of it is valuable in teaching us. And it convicts us and it, it corrects us. It instructs us in right living. It makes us complete Christians. It equips us for every work that the Lord has for us. This is our spiritual food. His word instructs us how to live our lives and how to serve the Lord. You know, the first work is that of believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Gospel of John chapter 6 verse 2. And then doing everything the Lord has us to do. Do you remember when the disciples were encouraging Jesus to eat physical food? John chapter 4 verse 32. He said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore he said 
to the disciples. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? See, they're thinking of physical food. And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. You know, the only way that we as Christians are going to be able to say we have finished the work is if we're gorging ourselves on God's word. We'll never know how to effectively live our lives as Christians unless we take in God's word. Unless we have the word of God in us, not to mention the enemy who seeks to tempt us away from obeying the word. What is Luke what Luke tells us in his same account of Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by uh, by Satan that Matthew does not is found in Luke 4:13 now when the devil had ended every temptation he was so worn out that that the angels came to minister to him but then it says in Luke chapter 4 he departed from him Satan departed from Jesus until an opportune time until an opportune time Listen, Satan is always looking for opportunities to take you down. He's always looking for opportunities to cause you to fall into temptation. As it says in 1 Peter 5, 8, he is like a lion roaming the earth, seeking, for, seeking whom he may devour. And the easiest way to fall prey to his schemes is by being ignorant of what God's word says. And I'm certain that one of the reasons today that Christians struggle and fail or fall into sin is because they don't hide the word of God in their hearts. Oh, they have it in their heads. I've, I've run into numerous people that they know it in their heads, but their lives are falling apart because they haven't hidden their word, the word in their hearts. Psalm 119.11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. This word hidden, it comes from a Hebrew word meaning to hide, to keep secret. It is used of concealing something often of great value. We all have things that we think are, are very, very valuable, and we hide them. Uh, sometimes, even with all it, we, we hide them. We'll, we'll put them someplace so that, okay, if the house gets broken into, they won't find this. We're going to make sure that they don't find this. We've all uh, have things like that. But, but do we value God's word enough to hide it in our heart? deep within the recesses of our hearts where it can transform uh, our souls, transform our lives. Listen to the words of Solomon, the wisest man to have ever lived. <coughs> Proverbs 4.20 My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart for they are, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Proverbs 7 1. My son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live, and my law is the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Listen to what the Lord speaks to uh, Joshua in Joshua chapter 1. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success go to the middle of your bibles and look at psalm chapter 1 uh, verse 1 psalm chapter 1 verse 1 right after the book of job Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. Whenever I think about the value of God's word, I often think of Psalm chapter 1, very first one. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. We'll never have to worry about walking in the counsel of the ungodly or standing in the paths of sinners or sitting in the seat of the scornful, we'll never have to worry about that as long as we, verse 2, his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. 
Now, the reason that I'm taking this break, the reason that I wanted to give you this particular message this very last Sunday of the year, is to use it as a springboard to begin yet another year of reading through the Bible. And I want to strongly appeal to you because I know there are people here who have never read through the Bible completely. And you certainly have never done it in a year. I used to be one of those individuals for years and years and years, even as a pastor, even, even in the ministry. Yes, I'd, I'd read collectively through the Bible, but I wasn't consistent in reading it in, in a year's period of time. When the church first started, I was so busy doing all kinds of things, working a, a job and, and starting the church, that I, I knew that everybody should have a Bible reading plan. That's what you do as a church. And so I'd put them in the bulletins and everything. And, and I, I, like many of you, would get discouraged after uh, missing several days or a week or two. And I'd decide uh, I'd start up again. And I'd, I failed a number of times until I finally thought to myself, you know, this is ridiculous. I need to have this consistent plan of just reading and getting God's Word deep into my heart. I believe, and I want to appeal to you, that if you'll commit to reading through the entire uh, Bible together, I've asked the leadership of the church, I've asked their spouses, I've asked uh, uh, our, our worship leaders, I've asked our women's ministry team, our staff, to commit to reading through it together. I'm certain that the more of us who do this, the more it will transform us as a church. It'll enhance our fellowship. We'll We'll begin to talk more and more about, uh, yeah, what did you think? Wasn't that interesting what we read this morning? What did you think about what so-and-so did uh, as we read this verse or that verse? It'll, it'll foster just healthy discussion and relationship instead of talking about a lot of times some of the silly things that we talk about. I'm believing that it'll transform us as a church, and I'm praying for that and believing that it's going to take place. In my early Christian walk, I suffered in my spiritual growth because I didn't have someone to encourage me in the importance of reading through the Word. Even when I was teaching a Bible study, I, I didn't have somebody help me to understand how the Bible was all connected together. I focused on the New Testament rather than seeking to understand the Old Testament out of ignorance. Because once you understand how the purpose of the Old Testament was to reveal God's plan for redemption through Jesus, and the New Testament is the revival of uh, that prophesied Messiah who would come, once you understand that revealed in the New Testament and the connection to the Old Testament, then you, then you begin to see Jesus as you're reading through the Old Testament, and you'll never neglect reading through the Old Testament again. And I'm going to share with you here in just a few minutes how I'm going to help you to be able to see Jesus in the Old Testament. Our minds, how many of you are checklist people? You love making checklists. I mean, you make, you make checklists about everything. Okay, brush your teeth. Uh, uh, but first, floss. Check. You, and, and you love that, that feeling of just checking it off. That was nice. Sometimes you make up stuff to put on your checklist just to check it off. Or how about if you, if you have a, an iPad or a phone and you, you, you just click it and it just puts a little check. You know you love that. Or you click it and it puts a line through it and changes the color. Or sometimes it just poof, disappears. We're, we're designed to kind of like checklists. And I want to uh, encourage you that our knowing our minds tend to think in terms of checklists, that you won't look at reading through the Bible as just another list you're checking off. Now, it is a sort of checklist as we're reading certain verses throughout the year. But set aside the thinking of just getting through it. Now, it's going to be difficult if you've not done it before. I mean, it's, it's difficult if you've done it before. Now, it shouldn't be, because reading through the Bible at a, at a nice contemplative pace shouldn't take you more than 15 to 30 minutes. And yet, it will be difficult. Why? Number one, because we're ridiculously busy. And number two, because the enemy doesn't want you to read through it. But I want to encourage you to press through. Every year, more and more people 
join us. How many people made it through this past year? You thought, I'm going to do it. How many of you made it through this? Put your hand up nice, nice and high. Okay. I'm not going to ask how many people tried and didn't make it or whatever because we've all been there on numerous occasions. But every year, more and more people join us, and I expect that this year is going to be the biggest and the best year effort. And to help you in that process, there are four things I want to provide you with, and I want to commit to you. Four things to encourage you to get through your readings through the year. The first thing is I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you on a regular basis. Every time I go to do my personal reading, I'm going to be thinking of you, and I'm going to pray that the Lord is going to be uh, give you strength to get through and tenacity to get through uh, reading through the Bible in a year. The enemy doesn't want you to. He doesn't want you to be in the Word. And he knows that the more time you spend in the Word, the less of a chance he will have to trip you up. He understands that reading through the entire Word of God is an integral part of your growth spiritually. It's an integral part of your maturity as a Christian. First Peter 2.1, therefore laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. I love little babies when, when they're born and how hungry they are for milk. And they, uh, I, my favorite thing as a dad was to just kiss them, just kiss their little lips, and, and man, if they were hungry, they, um, they'd be trying to latch on, and you know, if they got a hold of your lip, they were going to just, they, it was going to be like a vacuum. Man, it was just going to pull you over. That's the way we need to be, like, like newborn babes, just wanting to just latch on and just take in the word for all that it's worth. And Satan doesn't want you to do that. Paul tells us the spiritual battle we're in, encouraging us to put on the full armor of God. It says in Ephesians 6, 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word is the only offensive weapon in the armor of God. All the rest of the armor is defensive. It's to protect you from the enemy, but the Word is to attack the enemy. And whenever I read this verse, and I think of my early days as a Christian, and I think a lot of Christians who are trying to fight a spiritual battle and they're losing, I can't, rem I, I, I can't help but think of when my dad would take me to this one Chinese restaurant when I was a little boy, and he would always let me order, it was a special night, and he would always let me order a, a, a Roy Rogers, and they'd bring it, they'd have those little um, plastic swords, you know what I'm talking about, and they'd stick it in the cherry and they'd put it in, and you'd pull the sword out, then I always loved just pulling it out, eating the cherry, and then pretending like it was sword fighting. You know, and if uh, my brother was there, then we'd sword fight together and stick each other in the hands and everything. Sometimes I think that's how Christians are. The enemy comes and he starts trying to, and we whip out one of those little plastic swords. And we're ready to get the job. And he wipes us out. He, he destroys us. We need to be pulling out the big broadsword. Or the lightsaber. And we need to take people out. We need to take the enemy out. And how do we do that? We hide his word in our hearts. We hide the word of God in our hearts instead of just pulling out the little plastic sword. And we've got to be diligent in this or we won't be prepared to fight the enemy. So I'm committed <coughs> to pray for you. Ephesians 6, 17, take the helmet, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Know that I'll be faithfully praying for you to get through your reading with understanding. Second, if you have a bulletin, I want you to pull. You're going to see this is in there again, and this is also online. But you're going to pull this sheet of paper out right here. And if you didn't get a bulletin, get one on your way out. Or there's a bunch of these sheets that are on the information table. <laughs> what I'm going to do, and this is the first installment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you an email with a summary of the upcoming week's reading, which you'll receive Friday or uh, late Friday or Saturday uh, morning before Monday's reading. It's a preview. 
It's a preview of the reading for the coming week, like this one, obviously, Genesis 1 through 15, Matthew 1 through 4. Now, this first week is going to be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's going to be a partial week because I'm going to have our weeks be Monday to Sunday, Monday to Sunday. And what I'm wanting to do in the, in the email that we'll send you, this is a snapshot of what the emails will be like, It'll be a brief summary of what you'll be reading and the things to watch for which will encourage your faith. Uh, this is the one for this Wednesday through Sunday. Uh, there's more on the information table. And this email is going to go to everyone on our mailing list. So if you're not on our mailing list, then you're going to want to fill out this little sheet that's in your bulletin right here. And there's a place to check off, uh, I'd like to receive emails about the following. And you're going to just check that. You can check the ones you uh, want to get emails on. There's a couple of different things. But fill that out. Drop it into the, uh, into the offering box in the back of the sanctuary. And then you're going to be sure that you get this email that's going to start coming out the following week. Although I'm going to uh, send another one out this week that I'll explain, I'll explain to you what's going to be in that one here in just a second. If you, um, if you are already on the mailing list and you don't want to receive these emails, it's like, oh great, I knew I shouldn't have signed up. Here they come, here it comes. Then just unsubscribe. You're going to be able to unsubscribe. And you won't hurt my feelings. You won't, you know, we, I know we all get a lot of emails. The intention of this one is to really help you uh, by pointing out some significant things to be looking for in your weekly, uh, in your upcoming Bible reading. The third thing, within that weekly summary, in 2012, um, I committed myself to blogging through the entire Bible, a few verses uh, from each chapter. Uh, through the Bible. And then in 2013, I also made that available. And I was trying to, I was brainstorming with the staff, okay, how can we make this available to people who are trying to read through the Bible again to kind of encourage them in particular verses? And so this email that you get, it will have basically seven links for each day that you're reading. So you can click on that link and it'll open up a PDF of uh, the little commentary I did in 2012. Again, to just kind of spark some, some interest, maybe uh, share, share some insight that maybe you didn't see otherwise. Uh, I would also encourage you, send me an email telling me what the Lord is showing you. I was having our uh, meeting with, my meeting, weekly meeting with uh, uh, some of our worship leaders this last week and uh, encourage them. I said, it's important for you guys as worship leaders to be reading through the word together so that you can hear just uh, from a, uh, musically, spiritually, through praise and worship, what it is that the Lord wants to present uh, to the people. And I encourage them uh, to make notes of that. And then at our meeting, we're going to share what are some of those things. It's going to foster so much discussion and interaction about that and so I would encourage you to send me an email. Tell me what the Lord uh, showed, showed you. I'm always fascinated at the new insights the Lord gives us in verses that we've read over and over and over. If you have any questions about how these things are working, or if they're not working, let us know if they're not working. Um, then call the office, and, and uh, Cody or Whitney will be happy to help you, assist you with some of these things. The fourth thing... As many of you may know, uh, for the past several years, I've been writing a weekly devotional that comes via email. We also send some out regular mail. Comes out every Monday. Uh, the first year was simply called Be Encouraged, and then the next year it was called Jesus Words, and it was just Jesus' words, and it was a little devotional and prayer on that. This, and then it was In the Beginning, which was one from each chapter in the book of Genesis. This last year... Uh, was called Be Encouraged Remix, and I took uh, eight years previous of, of devotionals and just kind of picked some of my, my favorites out. Well, this year, I was praying about it, and several, a uh, few months ago, 
uh, the theme, the Word of God, taken from this verse, Matthew 4.4, 4, uh, came to my mind. And so each week throughout the year, I'm going to be sharing certain verses about the Word of God, verses that have been particularly encouraging to me, and I hope that it'll be encouraging to you as well. Again, these are all things that just spark our interest in what a powerful thing and a living thing the Word of God is. So send me your emails. Send me uh, your insight, and I'll do my best to respond in some way uh, uh, to them. Uh, I hope I get hundreds. That would be very exciting. I don't hope that for, oh Lord, what am I going to do now with all these emails? But I want to hear what God is showing you uh, through these things. And my email address is, is just ron at southhillcalvary.org, and I want to hear what God is showing you as this Wednesday we jump into uh, his word. Finally, I want to leave you with five things. If you're taking notes, five practical things. Five practical things. And if you're not taking notes, I would encourage you to take them. <coughs> five practical things for you to keep in mind as you start your Bible reading this Wednesday. Practical things to keep you from getting discouraged and help you get uh, the most out of your reading. And I know a lot of you have already been thinking about this. Uh, you're thinking, okay, this is the year. I'm going to do it. In fact, it's interesting. Uh, I looked at the blog uh, that, uh, of the daily Bible readings that, that I had done in 2012 and then redid in 2013. I looked at the stats, and I think, if, if I remember correctly, in January, like 150 hits, and then it went. Ooh. You could just tell that people were just, they were just dropping off, and then there was a little bit of a spike in July, which was at the halfway point, because I remember specifically that I exhorted everybody, hey, it's a halfway point, get back on the horse, and now you can do it. And there was a little bit of a spike, and then whoop. And why? Because the enemy doesn't want you to do it. He wants you to get discouraged. So I want to give you some practical things that are going to help you keep from getting discouraged and help you to get the most out of your reading. And remember that I'm going to be praying for you and I'm going to be reading right along with you. And so are the, the leadership and so many other people in the church. And you're going to hear me. Here's going to be the cool thing. And this is the difference between this last year and the previous years. I'm going to be looking specifically, Lord, what did you show us in our weekly reading that's applicable to the message on Sunday or the message on Wednesday? And uh, you remember in the past I've always said, uh, I've always said, we read this past week in our Bible reading through the year. I'm not even going to say in our Bible reading through the year anymore. I'm just going to say this past week we read. And I'm going to be assuming in faith that we're all reading. So number one, number one, purpose in your hearts to finish. There's purpose in your hearts to finish. No matter what, I'm going to read through the Bible in a year. Purpose in your hearts to finish. And you're going to need to be disciplined. How many of you out there have trouble with, with self-discipline? I have horrible trouble with self-discipline. You'll need to be disciplined. Listen to these words from K.P. Yohannan, who he's the president and founder of Gospel for Asia. I read this in a book he wrote one time. Quote, I encourage you to be militantly disciplined and not have pity on yourself. Those with the greatest impact on our world are those who live disciplined lives. Vigorous discipline is the expression of the inner life and commitment to God. I encourage you to choose this road. Be disciplined. Purpose in your hearts to finish. Try to set it aside the same time each day to read. Do it the first thing in the morning when your mind is the freshest. Now, there's few people in the evenings that, that their mind's fresh in the evening. I, I think that's the exception rather than the rule. If I don't get it done in the morning, I, I'm, by the time I go to bed, I'm brain dead, and it is not uh, going to happen. Make sure that it's a quiet place with no interruptions. Remember, you're communing with the Lord. These are the oracles of God. He's preserved them all of these years. He wants to speak to you. Uh, don't uh, take interruptions. I, I won't, uh, generally, when I'm reading the Word for my own personal devotional time, 
I won't take a phone call. I just send it to voicemail um, and because I, want, I, I don't want anything to interrupt what the Lord is saying. So number one, purpose in your hearts to finish. Number two, pray. Pray. Pray each time you read the Word. I don't pray each time I read the Word. I, I, I should. And I suppose I could say, well, I know in, in, in my heart the Lord knows that I'm wanting to know what He wants. But I want to just say, Lord, I want you to show me what you have for me today, for me personally. And, uh, and, I, wanted, and, I, know, and I want to pray that consistently. And then, Lord, what do you have for us as a church? Pray with confidence that the Lord will open your eyes to new spiritual truths. Things you've never known or you've never seen before. Ask the Lord to speak specific to specific situations that you're going through right at that time. No matter where you are, Lord, what do you want to show me from the text this morning that's going to help me with this situation I have at work? And don't second guess the Lord. Well, surely he's not going to want to show me anything. I mean, this is about such and such. And I know that don't discount what God can do. Let him show you something specific to something you're going through. When you come across something you don't understand, ask the Holy Spirit for understanding. And then be patient for it to come. Because it could be that the Lord uh, will bring understanding at some later point in your reading that day, or maybe even months later. Eventually it will come because the Holy Spirit's role is to be our teacher. It is, he, it is to teach us, and He will. So when you hit something you don't fully understand, don't be concerned about that. If this is your first year, <coughs> it may be the most difficult year, but trust that it will get better with each passing year. Uh, the first year uh, I read through it daily, it paved the way to me for future years, to where now, each year, I look forward to starting all over again. I look forward to starting all over again. And at the end of the year, you're going to be absolutely blown away with that feeling of accomplishment for having read through uh, the entire Bible. And then it becomes second nature to you. You just automatically do that. So, you're going to purpose in your hearts to finish. You're going to pray. Number three, expect that the Lord will speak to you. Expect that the Lord will speak to you. Keep a journal nearby to jot things that the Lord is saying to you. Things that he speaks to your heart. And it'll be fun to look at it the following year and to reflect on the things. Wow, that's so cool. Uh, find a way to do it. If, if you can do it electronically, if you can do it in, in your Bible program, if you can do it just do it in a way so that the next year you can go back through and you can see it and see the cool things the Lord show you. And then you'll be amazed. Wow, he showed me something totally different the following year. Number, number three, or number four, set realistic expectations. Set realistic expectations. Don't get caught up in doing an exhaustive study of the Bible. You're reading through the Bible, not writing a commentary. The goal is to thoughtfully read through the Bible in a year. Be disciplined, but avoid being legalistic about it. I always set my goals way too high, and I end up failing as a result of that. Uh, so uh, be realistic. Be driven to read by this, not by checking it off your list, but by the desire that the Lord is going to say something significant to you. If you miss a day, don't freak out. Don't panic. Just make it up the next day, even if you miss two or three days. But understand, if you get too far behind, you'll be more focused on just getting through it, checking it off your list, and missing on some of the nuggets that the Lord has for you. If you get five days behind, for whatever reason, sickness or vacation sometimes are the most difficult time to read, then, then you're going to have to tell yourself, okay, if this takes me 20 minutes to get through my daily reading and I've missed six days, you've got to block off two hours. You've got to block off two hours because otherwise you're just going to run through it, you're going to check it off, and you're not going to miss what the Lord has for you. Number five, get familiar with the layout of your Bible, how the books are laid out. Most Bibles have introductions to the books, little brief ones, so that you have an idea of who, when, and and why they were written. <clears throat> Understand how the Bible's put together chronologically. We're, I'm going to be making a chronological timeline 
of the Bible available to you. I like to print it out. I have, uh, I have some in my Bible uh, that helps me with that. I'd like to print it out so you can stick it inside your Bible or we can make an electronic so that you can look at it on whatever device you read your, your Bible on uh, because it's important to see how things come into play. Now, this first few weeks aren't going to make any difference because Genesis is chronological as is the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, but eventually we'll send that to you via mail or we'll have them available in the bulletin so that you can stick them in your Bible. And then finally, one more thing, and this is for some of you veterans who've been reading through the Bible for the second, third, or fourth times. Consider uh, trying or reading a different version. I've always read through using my uh, New King James Version, but this year I'm going to use the English Standard Version. I experimented a little the last uh, few weeks of this year and uh, have been enjoying that. It's, it's kind of got some, stirred my brain cells a little bit, and uh, it, I've been, every once in a while I have to go and compare it and go, okay, that, that doesn't sound right, and, and it's really interesting to do that. So if you've read through in the same version all the time, just change versions up and uh, just enjoy the process of getting God's Word into your hearts. Amen? Any questions? <coughs> Somebody was brave enough to ask a question the first service, and I rebuked them for the audacity to interrupt my teaching by asking a, a question. Isn't that, I'm just kidding, I was making a joke out of it when I did, but isn't it interesting how conditioned we are to sit in church? And in fact, somebody was telling me, just somebody in the worship team was telling me, they said, yeah, when she put her hand up, I thought, wow, what's she doing asking a question in the middle? We're just conditioned that way. If you have any questions, just uh, raise your hand or holler it out. I'll get it answered for you. Looking forward to reading through the Word together. Amen. Looking forward to Wednesday morning. And uh, in fact, just glancing through those chapters and writing this uh, for you, first 15 chapters of Genesis and then the uh, first four in the Gospel of Matthew was just thrilling and a reminder of how quickly you're going to see how significantly in those first 15 chapters, in the, by the third chapter, a picture of, of, in Genesis, a picture of Jesus clearly comes out in Genesis chapter 3. So we're going to have a blast together, and uh, how cool is it going to be at the end of next year to just know that uh, we've all uh, practically read through the Bible together. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together.